Welcome to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline. I'm your host, Monica Hadley, and with me is my co-host and mother, Caroline Kilborn. And good afternoon, everyone. And it's uh, January in Iowa, and it's cold. <laughs> <laughs> it is, but that's okay, because it could oh, be yeah. worse. <laughs> oh, be worse. it was much worse, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Weather can always be worse. <laughs> yeah, Yeah, isn't that the truth? So, Mom, who do we have with us today? Well, today we have a, a gentleman, John Ray, and John is uh, the author of uh, critically acclaimed novels, including The Lost Time Accidents, Low Boy, The Right Hand of Sleep, and Canaan's Tongue. He was named one of Granta's Best Young American Novelists in 2007, the recipient of the, writing, the Whitting Winning Writers Award and Guggenheim Fellowship, and a fellowship from the Fulman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library, and he lives in Brooklyn in Mexico City. And this book is amazing. And the title of the book is God Send. Well, welcome to Writers Forces, John. Thank you very much. It's fun to be here. So, why don't you just tell us the kind of the backstory to this book because it seems pretty interesting. This book began uh, in a very different way from other novels that I've written. Um, I was on assignment in Afghanistan uh, for the magazine Esquire, um, attempting to write an article about uh, a young American man named John Walker Lind, who uh, became w world famous, really, or, or, or infamous, maybe better said, after uh, September 11th. Um, as quote unquote the American Taliban, he was um, an American soldier in the army of the Taliban who, um, to everyone's surprise, uh, was discovered fighting in that country um, after the United States began its war in Afghanistan. He was taken prisoner along with uh, a, a few hundred Taliban soldiers, and um, it was just suddenly discovered that there was an American in the midst of them. Um, looking exactly like them, speaking exactly like his fellow soldiers. Um, he himself wasn't at all interested in being um, found out or brought back to the United States. Um, a very interesting case, um, uh, John Walker Lind became something of a scapegoat, really, after 9-11. Um, um, I think we as a country were looking for people to blame, and uh, we conveniently found him. So uh, he's been in, in prison ever since. Um, I was trying to write a, an article about him uh, and, and really more than just about John Walker Lind. I was in Afghanistan to um, try to find people who had known him um, when he was um, active in Afghanistan, when he was fighting there. So I was traveling around the country of Afghanistan. This was about less than a month after Obama had sort of declared mission accomplished in Afghanistan and, and had um, frozen the American military presence there. So it was a very strange time to be in that country. And I um, was really just in the process of, of finding people to interview about um, John Walker Lind and about the war from an, from an Afghan point of view. Um, I was being taken around the country by um, – a wonderful man whose whose name I'm not permitted to reveal, but who works as a as a um, go between and a translator and and a um, essentially a bodyguard for journalists in Afghanistan. And in the process of trying to find people who had known John Walker Lind, um, we were talking to an old man um, who was. Uh, sitting on kind of a, a, a sun-warmed adobe, low adobe wall on the outskirts of this little village, um, a big talker, very jolly old man. And I was asking him, did you know the American boy who had uh, fought with the Taliban? Had you, have you heard of him? Did you know anything about him? And he very cheerfully said, oh, yes, yeah, so I know all about the American boy. I also know about the American girl. And uh, both um, my companion and I were, were very surprised to hear this. Um, anyone who's spent any time in Afghanistan 
uh, or probably even read about Afghanistan could imagine that it's not the most hospitable uh, place for a young woman to be. Um, and we were just astonished. At first, we thought the the old man had misspoken or there was some um, language issue there. But he assured us that he uh, had not misspoken, that he that there had been a girl who had been involved uh, with the Taliban and with the war effort in some capacity. But from th from that point on, it became a lot harder. Uh, we, we, of course, instantly decided we would try to follow this story. But in the course of the next few weeks that I spent in the country, um, under somewhat tricky circumstances, uh, we weren't really able to put the story together in a way that would have made for a reliable and accurate uh, magazine piece, let alone a nonfiction book. And that's kind of when I remembered that uh, I'm, I'm a novelist, really. Uh, so that was a, that was fortunate that I that I did recall that. <laughs> And um, I guess I I just decided that that it might be suited to to that kind of approach, and uh, that maybe the gaps in what we knew or understood about this about this girl, who may in fact just be uh, the kind of legend that that springs up in countries during wartime, it's it's still unclear to me. Uh, I, I kind of realized that maybe um, fiction might might be able to make strengths of these sort of gaps in in what we knew rather than. Um, kind of impossible hurdles. Now, with John Walker Lind, was he over there before 9/11? He was absolutely. Um, uh, he he really with Lind, it's really a case of being in the wrong place at the wrong time, more than anything else. Um, he was a, he was a, a kid from Northern California, raised in a um, a sort of lapsed uh, Protestant family, uh, no Muslim background whatsoever who uh, gradually as a teenager became interested in other cultures, eventually interested in, in, in the Islamic world particularly, and it was a process of a number of years before he uh, converted to Islam. He, then he went to uh, Yemen and after that to Pakistan to study the Quran in uh, what's called a madrasa, which is, um, which is just a school where essentially they teach the Quran uh, more, you know, and, and almost nothing but the Quran. It's a very, very um, pious, um, essentially, a, essentially a divinity school. Um, and uh, while he was there, um, he eventually, you know, as young men will, became a little restless, it seems, and uh, fell in with maybe not the not the greatest company. And allowed his head to be turned a bit by um, rumors and reports of what was happening just over the border in Afghanistan. You know, it was believed that that a genuine um, sort of holy state was being established there. I mean, the world knew very little at that time about the Taliban. Um, and Lin knew maybe even less than most. Uh, so this was all this was all before Osama bin Laden or at least before anyone knew who that was is before 9/11 uh Afghanistan and even the Taliban were in, were weren't anywhere near uh the US State Department's enemies list in fact the United States government was trying to negotiate a complex a complex deal with the Taliban to run an oil pipeline through the country wow so we were trying to be we were trying to be fairly cozy with the Taliban and we were certainly not focused on the human rights abuses of that country because it was not convenient for us. Right. And and 9-11, really, the Taliban had very little to do with that. Yes, we now know uh, that they had little to do with it, little to nothing to do with it other than uh, making one very fateful strategic error, which was allowing Osama bin Laden and his people uh, in exchange for considerable financial support to take up residence in their country. They were, as far as anyone can tell, completely unaware of what uh, al-Qaeda were planning at the time. I mean, even the name al-Qaeda was not, was not well known at the time. Um, and unfortunately, in Afghanistan... Um, to understand Afghanistan, and especially the Taliban, one has to understand that the region that this all takes place in 
is essentially a tribal region first and foremost and a Muslim region only secondarily. Mm. So there's something called the Pashtun tribal code. The, the, the people living in, in this region are, are Pashtuns mostly, which is a tribe. And the first and most important tenet of this tribal code is that if you have a guest staying in your house or on your property, you will treat that guest as you would a member of your own family, and you will die if necessary to ensure the safety of that guest. Wow. So when the United States, after 9-11, demanded that the Taliban hand over Osama bin Laden, the Taliban were horrified at what al-Qaeda had done, not necessarily because they disapproved of it on, you know, philosophical grounds or theological grounds, but simply they realized that they had found, that they now found themselves in a position of going to war with the most powerful nation on earth. But they were unable to break the tribal code and hand over their guest, no matter how much they would have liked to do so. Oh, my goodness. So it was a very complicated situation. And in the middle of all this, or in the background of all this, you have this 20-year-old kid from Marin County, California, who just thought he was joining the army of a Muslim country that was under attack. Um, so he, 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 wasn't, he wasn't thinking of the United States at all. He wanted to kind of forget where he came from and, and have as little to do with the United States as possible. He was completely uninterested in terrorism, in any kind of... Um, action against the United States, but he just made a couple of really crucial mistakes. So who were the Taliban actually fighting at that point? The Taliban were fighting um, a loose coalition of warlords um, who later um, were kind of, after the United States went to war with the Taliban, you know, we, we kind of we got our PR people in there, and they they figured out a way to spin uh, this co coalition of warlords into what we probably all remember as the Northern Alliance. Uh, the Northern Alliance was a term that was bandied about quite a lot back in the days of, of the war in Afghanistan, uh, and it kind of sounds good, you know, ah, the Northern Alliance, you know, it it always used to remind me of the movie Star Wars, you know, you had the you had the brave rebel alliance fighting the evil empire. Sadly, the, the, the reality is that um, while I, I certainly would never want to um, to appear to be um, making any sort of apologies for the Taliban regime, which is really a horror, uh, the Northern Alliance was was absolutely no better. Um, they, they, they were groups of, of fighters who didn't really know what to do with themselves after the Soviet Union was kicked out of Afghanistan. Um, and essentially they lapsed from being, you know, the Mujahideen, which the Reagan administration praised as freedom fighters, to just being kind of mercenaries and eventually as, essentially a kind of mafia in uh, in in sort of post-Soviet war Afghanistan. I know this is all very complicated, but... <laughs> Well, it is complicated, and, and we have this tendency to, tr to try and look at everything in black and white. But, oh, yeah. Well, know, especially when we're trying to sell the idea of a war to the voting public. Absolutely. We, we, we definitely, I think, and when I say we, I mean, <laughs> I mean they, I mean whoever's in power in the U.S. at the time, they, they really try to simplify things and boil things down to as close to black and white as possible because they want voter support, but... The, the situation in Afghanistan really was one very problematic uh, group of individuals fighting another highly problematic group of individuals. And women were really caught in the crossfire here, weren't they? Absolutely, yeah. 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 It, it's, it's almost impossible to imagine now, but there was a period of time uh, in Afghanistan, and I'm talking now about the 70s, 60s and 70s, um, when the country was was um, was not quite, um, I, w I would hesitate to call it progressive, but it was a little bit akin to the way uh, Iran was um, before the Ayatollah Khomeini came to power. 
Um, it was it was a more open society, uh, a, a society with lots of problems, but not nearly the kind of almost medieval um, fundamentalist society um, that we think of now. Um, so there was a period of time when when life for women in Afghanistan was at least relatively. Um, Where a girl could get an education. Yes, a, yeah. a a woman could go to school. A woman could um, could work in public. Could work behind the the counter of a of a shop. Could um, could, now, when, could walk when, across town unaccompanied. You know, the, and these things are not possible anymore. When did the Soviets invade? Um, the Soviets basically, um, well, they had a regime in place for a number of years. Uh, and tried to sort of appear that they weren't really running the country of Afghanistan. And it was only when that, when there was a, a successful revolution against that very corrupt regime that the Soviets simply rolled in. Mm -hmm. And um, that happened uh, right on the cusp of the 80s, basically. Now, I had read somewhere, and I don't know how true this is, but that, that the Soviets um, tried to liberate women even more in Afghan and you know there were women in positions of power in the Soviet regime and that the Taliban gained power as backlash to that um, I think there there's there's certainly some truth to that um, I think there's no question that when the Soviets ran uh, the country um, they were running it in accordance with I, I suppose what you might refer to as Soviet values so uh, certainly relative to the Taliban regime, you know, if, if one looks at the Soviet Union, the history of the Soviet Union, uh, where while women's rights weren't necessarily at the absolute forefront of the priorities of, of, uh, of the Soviet regime, they certainly were not um, being dictated by uh, fundamentalist Quranic law. Yeah, women didn't uh, seem to be any more oppressed than everybody else. Uh, <laughs> In, in yeah, yeah. yeah, I would say, I would say, yeah. When when everyone is miserable and and uh, when no one has rights, I suppose it could be yeah. you could view it that way. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that I think that I don't think it was an ideal place to be a woman, even the Soviet Union. I think in the early years of uh, after the Bolshevik Revolution, there actually was kind of a golden era. But uh, uh, I mean, if you look at at the sort of later decades of the Soviet Union, um, the men were pretty much running the show. But, well, that's true. Uh, yeah. But but the, the the idea I think that the Taliban came to power as a result of people disapproving of um, women's rights under the Soviet uh, regime that that may have played a part. That may have been a factor. But a, a far more immediate factor was that um, these warlords that I've mentioned and, and, and uh, who were later described in glowing terms uh, when they were our allies as the quote-unquote Northern Alliance, uh, were essentially, they were, they were almost like drug cartels in uh, the way we imagine drug cartels in Mexico. Um, first of all, they, they were involved in the drug trade. You know, Afghanistan is, is an important producer of, of poppies, of heroin wow. and opium. Very important producer, still is actually. Um, but but really, you had these 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 armies that no longer had a war to fight once the Soviets were kicked out, and had a lot of weapons and a lot of money because the United States had been supporting them in this war for years. Who just essentially didn't want to put their weapons aside and you know just so had had no other skills basically and just kind of turned yeah. on one another. They turn on one another and they kind of carve the country up and set up, uh, among many other things that are that are a little bit like the cartels, they set up roadblocks and simply charge people money to use roads between villages, between communities. And these these kind of tolls that they that they demanded became steeper and steeper and steeper until people could barely afford to live. And certainly all commerce and trade was was almost stamped out under these um under these and, and there would be constant fighting between the different warlord factions it was just chaos essentially and you uh, went and, and you went over there to uh research in this area <laughs> yeah well you know actually when i went over there um the united states war against the taliban um 
had essentially was in a stage in which people were in Washington, D.C. were talking about it as pretty much done. Okay. Uh, so it was a brief period. It was sort of a calm before the second storm, if you will. Um, it was a period of time when it seemed as though we'd done a pretty good job of stamping the Taliban out. Uh, I mean, no one that I encountered in Afghanistan believes that, but that was certainly – uh, the rhetoric in Washington at the time. So I, I had, I was lucky in that I just almost by chance found myself in Afghanistan in a, in a, in a lull in the fighting. You're listening to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline, and our guest today is John Ray, author of Godsend, which is his fifth published novel. John, do you have any uh, novels sitting in drawers? Is this the fifth that you've written or just the fifth that you've published? It's the fifth that I finished. Um, ah. I I have some I have some. Yeah, I have a bunch of of of. You know, I I I don't even want to say half finished novels in drawers. I have some some ideas uh, that turned out to lead nowhere. That are I, I have one drawer of my desk that's full of uh, manuscripts I never want to look at again. <laughs> You never know, though. That's true. Because history can bring something to the forefront that you never imagined, and and you might be able to write something about it. That's absolutely true. Now, do you ta are all of your books kind of um, involve sort of the political, cultural, um, you know, recent history? Is that kind of a theme that runs through for you? It actually isn't. Um, they're pretty different one from another, um, and I've sometimes uh, even even found myself uh, criticized for that a little bit. Um, I, I think that for me, if I've spent two, three, four, five, at least on one occasion, even seven years working on a on a project, um, the next thing that I, I do. It, the idea of, of, of writing another book that was in a similar vein uh, is, is kind of terrifying. So uh, in, in the end stages of finishing a, a novel, I'll already be sort of daydreaming about what I guess what I would rather be doing. So then I, I end up writing a very different thing that the next time around. Um, the, the first novel I ever published, uh, The Right Hand of Sleep, was, I suppose, a political and historical novel. It was set between World War One and World War Two in Germany and Austria, and it sort of had to do with the rise of the Nazi Party and, and fascism in, in Europe. So that one was, was a kind of historical, political thing. My second novel was, um, was kind of a gothic southern novel set on the lower Mississippi uh, in the 19th century and, and was, was really about a particularly creepy... Um, aspect of the slave trade, um, and and that novel was a little bit of a, a, a kind of almost a magical realist book. There was there were sort of magic events that happened in it, and there were ghosts and all sorts of really nice gothic stuff. That was really fun. Oh my gosh! Um, and my third book took place in New York City in the present day, and it was about a a, a teenager who suffers from schizophrenia who. Um, who runs away and, and, and sort of spends 24 hours in, on the subways in New York. And then the last book that I wrote before Godsend, The Lost Time Accidents, was, was really a, a science fiction novel about time travel. Okay, you're well, all you, over the you, place. You, I'm I all guess. over the map. Yeah, well, that's great. That's great. But it's confusing for readers, I think. Well, what do you think? Um, it may be confusing for readers, but... Do you attract the same readers to book after book? You know, I think it's slowly, I think that is slowly happening. Um, earlier on in my career, my first three books or so, um, I sort of despaired of that ever happening. And um, used to ask myself a lot, you know, why do you have to do something totally different every time? What if someone liked the last book? They might hate this book. <laughs> Uh, and I'm sure that happens sometimes. And, and as I said, there were some critics. There's a, a wonderful book critic at the uh, Los Angeles Times named Carolyn Kellogg, who um, who in a, in a review kind of said, you know, 
with John Ray, you quite you never quite know what's coming next, and I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing, you know. So it's it's been a strange sort of journey for me, but you know, I think the hope as a, as a writer is that eventually people, I suppose, when they hear your name, they they have some sort of set of associations and and think, oh, this person might might be interesting to check out what you know what what he or she does next. And um, and I think that's slowly where I'm where I'm where I'm getting to. Um, things things are going well uh, well these days, so uh, I really can't complain. But it's been a long road. It's been a long and bumpy road. Did you always plan to be a writer? I had no idea what I wanted to do until I was well into my twenties, or or rather, I had many ideas of things I wanted to do, <laughs> and and it turns out I wasn't good at any of them, but this one. I played music. I um, I was in art school for a while. I studied biology and ornithology. I thought I wanted to maybe um, um, do research into bird migration. I um, was briefly an anthropology major. I dropped out of a couple grad school programs. I was really a mess, to be honest. Yeah, but look at this. You can use that experience in some of your future books. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I mean, uh, when I'm feeling optimistic, I'll look back. I look back at sort of how I spent my 20s and maybe part of my 30s. And I think, well, it, it's marked by a lot of confusion and self-contradiction, but also a lot of curiosity about the world, curiosity that went in all mm -hmm. sorts of directions. And I think that is probably pretty useful for a writer. Oh, yeah, I would think so, because I was I was going to say, you know, you you describe the terrain of the Middle East so like every stone practically, and I, I thought, <laughs> how in the world do you do that? Well, now I know, of course, because you were there. So the settings of the other books, um, what where were they set, some of them? Um, well, the first one was set in um, in the Alps, Central Europe, Austria, Switzerland. The second one was set uh, in uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, mm -hmm. uh, Tennessee. The third one was set in uh, Manhattan and Brooklyn and Queens. And the fourth one is all over the place. The fourth one starts in – the fourth one uh, sort of follows the way that my family kind of got to the United States. So it starts in Central Europe and goes to – Vienna and then to Italy and then to New York City and then up to upstate New York and um uh yeah so all of those are places that I that I made sure I went to and spent some time in sometimes it's not even that important to when, when you go to places that you're going to write about to to you know try to do too much historical research or or, or you cuz you can you can do that at the local library you know but when I go, yeah. when I was in Afghanistan, I was really trying to get a sense of how it smelled there and how dusty it was and mm -hmm. what it felt like uh, when the sun was shining on you and 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 what people ate and what what the food smells were and and what it sounded like when you're walking through a, a crowded market and everyone was kind of chattering all around you and 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 doing their business. That that kind of stuff. There, there's stuff that you just can't get if you don't go. On the second day that I was in Afghanistan, um, my uh, my companion who was taking me around the country um, took me up towards the border to Pakistan, which is a very uh, one of the more dangerous areas, or uh, or at least it was at the time. And he addressed me um, in a very traditional way. Uh, I had grown my beard out. Um, and and I was quite amazed that as we drove through these little villages um, in this tiny little car, no one really looked twice at me. You know, um, there actually are a lot of fair haired, blue eyed people in Afghanistan. Um, oh, really? And at one point I had to uh, answer the call of nature, shall we say. And we pulled over in this little kind of kind of spot by the side of the of the road uh which was clearly an area that that people used to you know to go to the bathroom and there were uh, a, a number of people um kind of a number of men sort of 
doing just that at the at the time. And um, I said, okay, I'll just hop out. I'll be right back. And I went over to sort of where you know what seemed to be the designated area to to relieve yourself. And I you know just very normally sort of set about doing that. And all of a sudden, I heard footsteps running behind me. And the man who was taking me around the country and responsible for my safety almost tackled me. And he said, what are, you, what are you doing? What are you doing? And I had no idea what he was talking about until I looked around me and I realized in Afghanistan, whether you're a man or a woman, if you are urinating, you squat. Ah. And I was the one person standing up like a jackass. <laughs> Well, now that's um, interesting because one of the things, you know, in Godsend, the character Aiden Sawyer is trying to pass as a boy in that's Afghanistan. Right. And the fact that makes it a little easier, doesn't it, for her because she does have to go to relieve herself outdoors, maybe yeah. not in full view, but possibly in partial view. Yeah. And. You know, that episode, of course, as you as you mentioned, found its way directly into the book and and was extremely useful to me um, because, uh, it, as it turns out, um, as strict and risky a place as Afghanistan would be for uh, a woman or a girl to travel, uh, there are many conventions, many sort of social conventions and conventions of dress that actually make it far far easier than it might be in the United States. For example, even the men in Afghanistan wear, wear a very traditional, um, most of them, wear a very traditional form of clothing called a shawar kameez, which is basically these very, very loose baggy pants and then a long shirt. I'm sure you've seen pictures of, of um, Muslim men dressed this way. A very long shirt with, with essentially square shirt tails that go down to the knee. So even the men are almost wearing a kind of, of, of dress, really. Mm -hmm. And when they squat on the ground to, um, to urinate, for example, they're still completely hidden. Uh, you don't see, any, you don't see any, any bare flesh, really, because the loose flaps of the shirt, front and back, form a kind of a little tent, in a way. Ah. Um, and so it, it's, a, it's a country very much kind of ruled by notions of... of um, modesty and propriety, and you never really see anyone's body clearly. Interesting. So that made it more possible for her to pass as a boy. That's right. Yeah. You're listening to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline, and our guest today is John Ray, author of Godsend. John, how about reading a little bit from Godsend so we can get a, um, get a feel for it? I'd be happy to. Um, so I'm going to read the very first page of the novel, um, which is sort of a fragment that uh, Aidan Sawyer, the protagonist of the novel, um, writes uh, to her father, who's a professor of Islamic studies back in California, where she's come from. Um, but when she's writing this little fragment, she's already in Afghanistan. She's already... Um, with a group of militants. Uh, she's, she's essentially run away from home. And then the second section I'm going to read um, is, a, is my attempt at describing um, what a U.S. drone strike might appear like from the point of view of, of the people who are actually being hit by the drones. Dear teacher, here I am now, where you said I'd never be. I'm writing this from the place that you told me about, and it's as beautiful and terrible as everything you said. You said blue sky and cold and bad roads and worse water. You said snow in the houses and shit in the streets. A God-fearing people, you said. All those fancy descriptions, all that talking down to me like I was six years old. It's cold here, okay, but I never feel cold. I'm with people that know me. I'm with people that will die for me. And on my best days, when I'm not afraid, I know I'll do the same. Can you think of one thing you could say that about? You were right about this country and the way that it would take me. 
Dear teacher, I should have known better. I should have been careful. You were right about all that, but you were wrong about one thing. You said I'd never make it to this place. And here I am. The second bit I'm going to read, uh, as I said, is fairly late in the book. Um, and it's uh, really just a description of a drone strike on a small Afghan village. Um, and Aidan Sawyer, at this point in the novel, is going by the name Suleiman and has been disguised as a boy for quite some time. The droning grew deeper and more powerful with each breath Aiden drew until it seemed to shake the mortared vault above her. It was only once she'd managed to stagger out of the house onto the street that she saw that it was coming from the sky. Suleiman, came her friend Ziara's voice. What in God's name are you doing? Can't you see the planes? Ziara's voice was sucked up into the droning, and Aiden shook her head and kept walking, staring down at the cobbles beneath her feet, her right arm extended in case she should fall. She heard shouting behind her and quickered her step. Two streets ran downhill from the town square's southeast corner, and when she reached it, she turned left again into the old bazaar. Down a covered passageway, she glimpsed a group of children darting from one stall to another, and she seemed to see the merchant's son among them. The noise from the sky was shrill enough now to break glass, but there was no glass anywhere for it to break. She passed stalls in the market with images crudely painted on their shutters of the wares for sale within, sandals and tinware, and handmade plastic roses tied in Pakistan or China, and felt a childish urge to force their locks and hide there from the droning. Now that the truth had been revealed, she felt no fear, not even sadness, but only a hopeless, clear-headed exhaustion. She was walking like a girl again, like an 18-year-old girl and an American. She hadn't forgotten. She undid her head cloth as she walked and let it hang down from her shoulders. Perhaps some buried part of her even exulted. A Tajik in a sequined cap came running up the street and knocked her over, excusing himself elaborately as he stumbled on. Aiden was almost to the first of the terraced barley fields above the village when she heard her friend Ziar behind her. The droning had dimmed, and she could hear the wind in the holly oaks bordering the path, and his footfalls on the gravel, and his hard, insistent breathing. Though his eyes were wild, he kept his distance from her. He carried a Kalashnikov slung from his shoulder and clutched his cap in his hands, so that he stood before her as bareheaded as she was herself. She'd seen fervor in his eyes before, even some unnamed species of desire, but never the helplessness she found there now. His desperation was plain in his faltering walk and in the pleading voice with which he spoke her name. Sulema, he murmured, climbing circumspectly toward her. On his lips, her name became a question, and the question seemed addressed to all the world. Can you see them? She asked him. I, I can't hear you, he answered. Can you see the planes? They aren't planes, the R said. He seemed to be relieved to be asked a question he could answer. Not the one I saw. Too small. No pilot inside. Missiles, then, said Aiden. Not missiles either, said CR. There's been no explosion. Why, she said. He was within arm's reach of her now. Why hasn't there been an explosion? I can't tell you why. God help us, Suleiman. I have no idea. Mm 
Aidan leaned toward him then and took his hand in hers. It felt as smooth and unresponsive as a piece of polished wood. She was opening her mouth to ask his forgiveness when the house behind him disappeared and a wall of stunned air knocked them flat and strafed them with debris. Zr cried out, but his cry was oddly muted. Life returned to her limbs as a spasm of fear, and she lurched onto her feet just as the second shockwave hit. The mosque was gone, and its courtyard was gone, and so was the schoolhouse behind it. It seemed to her not that missiles were colliding with houses, but that houses were rising up into the clouds. It seemed more a weather pattern than a technological event. Aiden was aware of shrieks in the intervals between the explosions and of the hail of falling matter and of men firing frantically into the clouds. But none of this detracted from the stillness. There was only stillness now, though she could see smoke raveling upward behind streaks of yellow tracer fire and two women running naked through a brightly burning field. She hadn't seen a woman's legs or arms since California, and the women were very beautiful, and in all that landscape, they alone seemed understandable and real. The first was running barefoot with a chemise pressed to her bosom, and the second wore nothing at all. Then the edge of the field was lifted like the corner of a carpet, and the women were gone, and Zr was running toward her through the stillness and the smoke. So that's just a few pages. <laughs> and that's from Godsend. You know, is is, Shu, is Shuleiman a common name in that part of the country of the world? It is actually. Um, uh, as you as you most likely know, um, what we think of what we think of as the Bible is in fact included as one of the holy texts of Islam, and so many of the important figures of both the Old and the New Testament are um, are also important figures in the Islamic world, and so the name Suleiman, for example, which is also pronounced Shuleiman um, in certain parts of the world. Is, is King Solomon. Ah, okay. I think, you know, have you seen the Jack Ryan um, series on Amazon Prime? I have not. Is that the one with John Krasinski? Yes, yeah. And I'm pretty sure that the, one of the main characters, um, Middle Eastern characters, is named Shuleiman. Oh, that's quite possible, yeah. Yeah. That it's that that's a real, I do recommend that because I feel like it gives a, a pretty accurate depiction of kind of the politics behind the terrorism mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah I'd be interested to see it um, yeah. hopefully it can uh, can uh, serve as a correction for some other series that uh, got it pretty horribly wrong like 24 or Homeland yeah I didn't watch either of those but mm, uh, those are those are some pretty problematic series uh, yeah. for anyone who knows anything about the Islamic world that's for sure um, when you're writing this, you know, you're back in the U.S. or somewhere else, you're a long way from Afghanistan, how do you remember all the details that you put into the book? Well, um, that can sometimes be a challenge. Um, you kind of, you kind of just have to trust your intuition and, and believe that whatever the story requires will sooner or later be dredged up by your by your mind, either consciously or subconsciously, you know, and, and you'll sort of find the, the, the pieces of the puzzle that you need. Um, in a way, in this particular case, I was helped um, to remember things in Afghanistan vividly by the fact that I was pretty scared most of the time that I was in Afghanistan. And as I, I as I think we all know, you know, when you're scared, you're very alert and you tend to remember times when you were really frightened uh, with a bit more clarity, maybe than times when you were just feeling kind of comfortable and, and carefree. 
I never really thought about that, but that makes a lot of sense. In yeah, so I recommend I recommend being terrified uh, <laughs> as a um, as a research tool. So, mom, do you have some questions? Well, I was just uh, I was just thinking, you know, we we tend to judge people so much in other other countries and other customs, and we rely on the media to tell us about them. And how else can we find out? How can we find out about people if we don't if we we want to? find out for ourselves what are the some of the what are some of the resource things we can use john that's a really good question um i mean i suppose in the best of all possible worlds uh we would all have the time and the financial resources to do a lot more traveling Mm -hmm. um certainly there's no better way to realize that there are other ways of doing things, other ways of living one's life, other sets of values that might also work for people um, than traveling. Uh, But not everyone can do that, obviously. Um, I mean, I had kind of arranged this job with Esquire as a way of of getting to Afghanistan so I wouldn't have to try to pay for it all myself. But I think in a way now we, we, we have... We have um, means to learn about other cultures that that maybe we wouldn't have had 20 or 30 years ago. Um, I mean, first of all, just the kinds of documentaries that you can get more or less for free uh, on the Internet um, can be incredibly valuable. Although, again, you have to know where to find those. I mean, the problem with the Internet is that it's almost sort of an infinite number of options, and, and a lot can get lost that way, too. Right, and it's also hard to know what you can rely on because there's a lot of a lot of completely bogus documentaries, at least from That's my right. point of view, they're bogus. Um, oh, sure. <laughs> but, you know, another great thing about the United States, of course, is that um, – Regardless of what part of the world you might find yourself interested in, there's a fairly good chance, unless you live in the remote mountains of Wyoming, for example, there's a fairly good chance that there's probably a small community of people from that part of the world, maybe even in your city or your town. Oh, um, yes. You know, I mean, to be honest, as corny as it sounds, if you're interested in, let's say, Pakistan, there's probably a Pakistani restaurant not too far from where you live. And it's not a bad way to learn about another culture. I mean, I'm a big believer in food as kind of like <laughs> a good entry point for, for becoming accustomed with, uh, you know, to any, any foreign culture. Food's always a good way in because everyone loves to talk about food. We all, we all like food. Um, and food. We all can, have to have it. <laughs> we all have to have it. Um, I mean, I'm one of those people, whenever I'm traveling, I kind of, um, if you know, even if I'm just on vacation, I'll, I'll try to plan things around what I've learned about the best places to eat. Oh, absolutely. I mean, food is kind of the whole point of traveling. Yeah, and it's <laughs> awfully hard to share a meal with someone uh, and not feel a certain kinship to them and sympathy for them and ability to relate to them. Um and, and uh, you know, since traveling in Pakistan and Afghanistan, uh, it's really changed um, – it's really changed the experience of going to, uh, to Pakistani restaurants for me. You know, and many of the restaurants that are – that we think of as Indian restaurants in the U.S. are actually uh-huh. – um, are actually owned and run by Pakistanis. And, and once you have a kind of bit of – you know, at least for me, you know – Having a bit of knowledge as, as to as to what life is like in Pakistan now, I really find that I get into lots of really interesting conversations with people, um, just in the course of of, uh, of having a meal. You're listening to Writers' Voices with Monica and Caroline, and our guest today is John Ray, author of Godsend. Hey, John, before we run out of time. When I was uh, reading some of the articles that your publicist had uh, sent me links to. There's this one about um, your home in Brooklyn being a writer's colony. (laughs) You want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. um, Boy, where should I start? (laughs) Right now, um, 
the front door is uh, – the lock is broken and the um, the hot water boiler is malfunctioning. So I have um, a bunch of writers who are complaining to me pretty vocally. And writers can really complain in a very eloquent way. I'll tell you, that's one thing we're good at. Um, yeah, the, uh, basically I was um, – walking down the street in Brooklyn about seven years ago. And um, I saw kind of a, an abandoned looking brownstone, an abandoned looking sort of row house, um, and happened to notice uh, that there was a little handwritten piece of paper taped to the one window that wasn't broken that said, for sale, inquire, you know, inquire at this number. And uh, I'm not sure what motivated me. I'm not, you know, I'm not really an aspiring real estate speculator. But um, I got in touch with the person. I guess it was kind of a slightly desperate time for me. I wasn't sure how much longer I was going to be in New York City. And somehow one thing led to another. And, and over the course of years, um, I and some friends of mine uh, slowly found ways to renovate uh, this this building that some of us now live in. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's, it's a fairly sizable brownstone. So there are a number of, of rooms that um, I've been able to rent out to other writers here in Brooklyn, uh, mostly friends of mine or friends of friends. Um, so during the day, um, sometimes there are as many as seven uh, people working in different little offices and, uh, and writing their books here. And oh, do some of them live there too? Yeah, um, three of them, three of those seven people live here, and um, the rest mostly just uh, just work up in their rooms and then play ping pong in the basement. <laughs> and I understand there's drums, there's drums in the basement too. Yeah, there's there's a little kind of music space set up. <laughs> um, it has a very deep basement, so we can make noise without upsetting the neighbors. Ah. And. Um, uh, I used to be, I used to smoke cigarettes and uh, struggled for a long time to quit. Uh, and one of the hardest points in my day was when I was, when I was working and writing, because as you work, you, you get a little restless, you get a little antsy, you store up a little nervous energy. And I was used to taking cigarette breaks uh, and found it very hard to get over that um, until I started taking drum lessons. And... <laughs> Now, for the last four or five years, instead of, you know, in my sort of um, attention deficit disorder way where after 15 minutes of work, I have to jump up and pace, instead of lighting up a cigarette, I'll just sit down at the drum kit and, and, and bash away for a while. And that uh, seems to work quite well, and it's, it's definitely healthier. Now, I understand Good. your writing process may be a little different than most people in the computer age. You don't actually write directly on a computer. Is that true? Uh, it depends on the book, but uh, but ge generally speaking, that's right. Um, I have a really ugly old, you know, those electric typewriters from the 80s. They would kind of have that kind of weird hum when you turn them on. Um, you know, not not a, not a, not a beautiful old typewriter from the 40s. This is a really <laughs> ugly um, IBM office typewriter, um, and somehow. When I turn it on and it makes that really weird hum, it's kind of like the get to work noise for me. And it just makes me feel like I, I really need to be um, be productive. Also, I find that then once I have the rough draft type written, I'll, I'll enter it into um, my laptop and it forces me. It sort of slows me down in a, in a good way. And it forces me to consider every single word that I that I kind of churned out on the typewriter once again. So it forces a really thorough revision when I when I put it into the laptop. So wh why do you um, have you did you like start writing on this type of typewriter thirty years ago, forty years ago, however long it was, and then just stayed with it, or how did you come to choose this as your preferred mode of operation? That's a that's a great question. I've never been asked that question before. Um, I actually in the '90s, in the early '90s, um, I bought one for my grandmother, 
uh, actually, that was a brother. It was an electric brother typewriter. She was having a hard time using her old manual typewriter to write her letters, and her hands were a little shaky, so she couldn't really um, use it, you know, just just uh, write them by hand. Um, so we found this typewriter um, that's, you know, an electric typewriter is you don't need to hit the keys very hard. And um, I got it for her, and she used it for a little while, and then she kind of lost interest in it. Um, at which point it was just sitting around the house and I started using it since she wasn't using it and, um, kind of got hooked on it for some reason. I mean, I don't know why it's, it's a really ugly machine, but <laughs> if it does the job, that's the main thing, isn't it? Exactly right. If it does the job, that's the main thing. I mean, that's sort of, maybe that's my mantra for writing in general. You know, um, I feel as though. Writing is something that's been so mystified and romanticized and, you know, all, you know, a lot of people when they start out think you have to wait for inspiration to strike every day or, you know, the muse or something. Uh, I, I really have always tried to kind of clear away all of that sort of um, nonsense, really, and approach it as as an almost kind of daily grind kind of job, you know, and not not treat it as this magical event because that's something that of course you have no control over um so when i was uh, in my 20s i was i had a, a job for a little while editing um what are called industrial videos they're they're kind of videos that companies or corporations make for basically for their own employees and um there was one that we were that we were working on about um a company that made pvc pipe <laughs> and and there was kind of this recurring um, phrase in in this in this video we we're editing, which was extrude the product. And that phrase, extrude the product, just became my personal writer's <laughs> mantra, because it's the it's the farthest thing from any kind of romantic approach to writing, and and I found it very useful. Right, well, that's right. well, thank you, John. That we'll keep that in mind. I, thank it, you so it, much. It, it's a very visual image, too. Right. <laughs> and we're kind out of haunting. we're out of time. And I really enjoyed having you today. Thank you so much. And mom, do you have some final words for us? Well, I do. Um, we often judge people of other cultures and countries. It would be good to study their lives and customs to find out not our differences, but that we are all of the same place, members of the human race. I agree. So do I, and see you all next week on Writer's Voices. Bye -bye. Thanks so much.